So thanks for coming for the uh, last session today. Uh, today I'm going to give you a, a sort of the overall structure of how you typically prove a, a strong hardness of approximation result and we'll do it in the context of this problem called max k cover which introduces a lot of the ideas without having too many technical complications. Actually probably we won't even quite finish the proof but we'll see what we can do. Uh, okay, so you need to remember a few things that I uh, talked about last time. So last time I mentioned that uh, the key problem that seems to be uh, the mother of all these strong hardness of approximation results is called uh, max, well, for the purposes of this lecture I call it max projection because I think that's a nice name for some weird historical reasons it's called label cover and I think that's how Eric mainly referred to it um, today. Um, so it's a bit of a funny uh, problem but it's not too complicated. So remember um, it comes with two parameters, integers L and R. And uh, with these parameters, uh, the input to the problem is a bipartite graph, okay, with bipartition u and v. I'm also going to assume that the graph has equal size uh, left and right side and that it's regular. This is not necessarily usually thrown into the label cover or max projection problem, but it's easy to achieve it always for, with some trivial reduction. Um, and more importantly, for each edge, there's sort of written on the edge in the input a constraint which says that how uh, you would sort of like to label uh, the vertices. So uh, the task is to assign a label to each vertex. So the, the vertices on the left in U get labeled by numbers between 1 and L, and the vertices in V get labeled by numbers between 1 and R. And uh, the projection on an edge sort of decides when this um, labeling is valid. So the goal is to maximize the fraction of satisfied um, constraints so among all edges, and we say a constraint is satisfied if the label that the assignment gives to uh, u, uh, the projection of that under the given pi is equal to the label given to v. Okay, does that make sense? So uh, that we know is actually extremely hard. So this, this problem is hard to approximate, so I should have written it here, but um, the key theorem that we'll use which is ultimately due to, I guess, essentially Ron Ross, uh, and hopefully we'll hear about it in some combination of Irit, Prahlad, and Ron's talks, are that um, one comma delta approximating this problem, uh, max projection, uh, is NP hard. To state it more precisely than I stated here, for all delta bigger than zero, there exists other constants L and R such that this problem is NP hard. Okay, so we want to start with this problem and we want to deduce the hardness for this other problem that I introduced last time, which I'll now remind you of. It's called max K cover. It's kind of a basic problem about uh, sets and coverage. It's a cousin to the set cover problem. Uh, so here you're given a bunch of sets and let's just call their union omega. And you're also given a number k, and you have to choose k of the sets to cover as many of the elements as you can, so the, whose union is as large as possible. And I'll also remind you of this notion of to uh, approximate a problem, which I use in this, this theorem statement. We say that we, uh, an algorithm C comma S approximates one of these optimization problems. First, it should be an efficient algorithm, but the, the main definition is that whenever it's given an instance whose best solution, whose optimum is at least C, you can prove that the algorithm at least gets S, okay? And maybe now after seeing Reed's talk, you'll see why this odd choice of C and S here, somehow it means completeness and soundness. Okay, so uh, these are the basics from last time and I'll tell you what we're gonna prove today. Uh, so we wanna use this hardness of label cover to do hardness for um, max K cover. And in particular, we're going to try to prove this theorem of uh, Thiga, which is sort of uh, related also to his theorem about approximating set cover, that gives NP hardness of one comma, basically one minus one over E approximating max K cover. Okay, so we're going to show that this problem is NP hard, which means that given a K cover instance where there's a perfect solution, there are K sets covering everything, it's still hard for algorithms to find that perfect solution. And indeed, it's hard for them to find K sets that cover a one minus one over E fraction of the um, ground elements or any number slightly bigger than that. Okay, and as I suggested last time, how will we prove this? Well, we're just proving an NP hardness result. So we just do a polynomial time reduction from an NP hard or NP complete problem. 
And this, this key theorem about Leifel cover or max projection that we have says that uh, even one comma epsilon approximating it is hard for every positive epsilon. So this is specifically what, let's say, uh, Will, well, Feige proved that there's a, for every delta, uh, and L and R actually, there's a polynomial time reduction from one comma, some function of delta, delta cubed over 1,000, approximating max projection to this thing we care about, one versus one minus one over E, plus delta approximating max K cover. Okay, so we can get hardness for any sufficiently small delta here we like, um, if we just get hardness for this problem with an even smaller delta, but the theorem assures us that for any small, even delta cubed over 1,000, there's some sufficiently large L and R which make this problem hard. Okay, is that outline clear? Okay. Okay. Let's, yeah, this is a good time to stop and get the, the idea. So that's a near the existence of a reduction. Right, I should see. But which problem is NP complete? Yeah. This problem is NP um, complete, or let's just say NP hard. So the fact that this problem is approximation is a... So this problem is NP hard, the first one. This is the theorem about label cover of Ras. Uh, this is not what you would next. No, so this I'm assuming. This you're assuming, okay. And it's, it's a theorem uh, from 95, yeah. and this is what... It's from PCP and parallel repetition. Exactly, it follows from PCP and parallel repetition, so hopefully we'll uh, eventually see most of the proof okay. through Ron's talks. So good, so this problem is NP hard by a theorem from 95, which we'll not prove, but we'll assume. And this means poly time reduces. And this is another problem which, uh, well, we now deduce is also hard. So I mean, this just simply means that if you could solve this problem efficiently, then you could use it as a subroutine to solve this problem efficiently. So since this problem is hard, it's NP hard, we deduce that this problem is also hard, which is our goal. And uh, our subsequent goals will be to prove all sorts of uh, optimal approximation result, inapproximability results for various <laughs> basic uh, problems. Okay, any more questions? Okay, good. Um, and by the way, this is, a, this is sort of an optimal result in that there exists an efficient algorithm, the greedy algorithm, which achieves exactly this without the delta. So doing anything better than the, the greedy algorithm is NP hard is what this is saying. Pardon me? K will be, uh, well, we'll see, but it'll basically be linear in the size of the ground set. Maybe the size of the ground set over a thousand or something. Okay. Uh, well, this is what I would like to prove, but it's a bit of a drag to exactly prove this. You have to do some extra annoyance. So instead, I'm going to prove one minus a quarter here, uh, which hopefully will at least uh, more or less satisfy us. Okay, so this will be three quarters instead. Okay, so how will we do this? Well, as I suggested in my last talk, we will do this by the same method we proved sort of textbooks and peak hardness results with uh, gadgets. We'll kind of construct a gadget, which is a particular finite sized instance of max K cover, like over some explicit finite number of uh, you know, ground set. And then we'll kind of combine it with all these edge constraints. We'll kind of glue it onto all the edge constraints in a given problem like this. Well, you'll see it more clearly later, but let me just give you the gadget, which is just an explicit instance of max K cover with some interesting properties. Okay, so. When I say gadget, I just mean an instance of the problem we're trying to show hardness for. And, um, okay, so in this gadget, the ground set omega will be identified with the Boolean strings of length capital R. Okay. And, um, sorry, the sets will be two times R of them. I'll call them S. 1 through S capital R with superscript 0, and uh, also S1 through SR with superscript 1. Okay, so there's two R sets. And uh, the K, the number of sets you're sort of allowed to choose is 2. And uh, I have to tell you what the sets are. So uh, the set S sub uh, J superscript B, this is either 0 or 1, this is between 1 and R, uh, equals the set of all X in the ground set such that X sub I equals B. 
Okay, so um, it's quite simple. You know, the J set with superscript zero covers all the strings that have a zero in the J coordinate. Okay. So it's a particular instance. I'm not claiming it's like hard or anything. I mean, it's explicit. Uh, K is just two, but we'll use it to build hard instances eventually. Sorry, this should be probably J. Is that okay? Okay, thanks. Good, so uh, let's make some observations about this instance. Okay, so what is the opt of this instance? If you allow, you, know, you allow yourself to choose two sets to cover as much of the ground set as you can, one, thank you. Very good, so the opt is one. It's possible to cover everything, 100% of the, the ground set with two sets. And in fact, and this is important, there are, there are optimal solutions okay, and they're just all of the form take S i zero, J zero, sorry, and S one uh, J. Okay, so then you get all the sets that have a zero in the J's coordinate and all the sets that have a one in the, sorry, all the strings uh, that have a one in the J's coordinate. So that's all of the strings. Okay, and these are the unique, uh, I mean, these are the only optimal solutions. And this is a key feature for gadgets as we'll eventually see, that there are optimal solutions that correspond to focusing in on like one coordinate. Uh, good. We can also make another simple observation. Is there any other solution? As uh, value at most, um, well, three quarters, thank you, yeah. Because if you're gonna take any other pair of sets, the worst thing, the terrible thing to do is take two copies of the same set if that's even allowed, which let's say it is. But g generically, you'll take maybe, I don't know, S50 and S1, you know, and you'll have covered all the strings that have a zero in the fifth coordinate or a one in the tenth coordinate. So um, that's three quarters of the strings. You miss the ones that have a one in the fifth coordinate and a zero in the tenth coordinate. Okay, and it's actually not at all any coincidence that these three quarters and this one are this one and this three quarters. Okay, that'll be the basis of our construction. Um, so we'll even need a sort of, in a way, a stronger property of the gadget, although these are all sort of trivial properties, which is that um, it's not just that any other solution where you take two sets does, you know, worse than the optimal solution. This is gonna be a very vague statement, but I'll write it anyway because it's somehow philosophically important. I don't know, even a sort of cheating solution taking some large constant number of sets um, does poorly if it's inconsistent. So what do I mean by this? Well, according to the rules of the game, you're only allowed to take two sets. But suppose I say, well, I'm gonna sort of cheat and take you know, 100 sets. Um, what this idea says is that you still don't do great, you still don't achieve the optimum if the 100 sets you take are somehow inconsistent. And what inconsistent means is really not corresponding to an optimal solution. So um, what I'd like to define is what consistent means. So I'll say that a list of T sets is consistent. Well, simply if it includes an optimal solution. Some S uh, J zero and S J one. Okay, so it takes both sets corresponding to one coordinate and this Relatively minor observation, but is actually the key to the proof, is that if it's inconsistent, so if you have a list of you know some T sets, but it's inconsistent, its uh, coverage is bounded away from one. It's at most one minus two to the minus T. Okay, so this fact is actually just a special case of this fact when T is two. Okay, so as long as somehow this, this idea, which will become important later, is that as long as you're, you can even cheat and take many sets, 
But as long as, if you're not doing it in a consistent way, then you're not getting the optimum. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, this is just like some elementary observations about a particular gadget. These are the observations that we'll need. So now I'd like to begin the proof of this theorem about the hardness of one comma three quarters approximating max k coverage. In other words, I'm going to begin, well, I'll give you the actual polynomial time reduction from max projection to max k cover, and then we'll start to prove things about it. Okay, so this is kind of a proof, although I won't quite do all of it probably. Uh, okay, so we're building a polynomial time reduction from max projection to max k cover. Uh, okay, so uh, the instance of max projection is this bipartite graph with a bunch of edges and also constraints written on the edges. This is u, this is v. We're supposed to label these guys by l, sorry, numbers between 1 and r on this side. Okay, and we need to ultimately output an instance of max k cover, so a bunch of sets over a ground set, ground elements, and also a number k. Uh, so basically the idea, roughly, is we're going to put a copy of this gadget, which is uh, there, on top of each edge. So uh, for each edge, we'll have uh, some ground elements, which I'll we'll call uh, omega sub e. And this will be equal or isomorphic, if you like, to 0, 1 to the r. OK, and overall, you know, the whole ground set will just be uh, the union of these uh, ground sets on each edge. So this is over E and E, and this is a disjoint union. So what I'm saying is we're going to put like 2 to the R little ground elements on this edge, 2 to the R little ground elements on this edge, 2 to the R ground elements on every edge. Okay? Uh, okay, that's the ground elements. Now we're also going to have sets. And the sets are going to be sort of uh, attached to the vertices, okay? so. For each uh, V in capital V, we're going to have sets uh, S superscript V1 through S superscript VR. Okay? And basically, a set, so we're going to sort of have sets sitting on the vertices here. And these sets will cover elements only if they're, you know, stuck on edges that that vertex touches, okay? So these sets will only cover elements that are sitting here and sitting here and sitting here. That makes sense, right? And I'll say it more explicitly. Um, so for a U prime, which is attached to V, uh, we'll say that S V J covers uh, the x's in omega sub u prime v uh, that have a 1 in the jth coordinate. Okay, so sort of uh, on this side we're covering 1's. Okay, so the jth guy here covers all the guys in here. Which think of them as strings that have a 1 in the jth coordinate. And we're going to do something very similar on the u side. So. Similarly, for u and u, and u um, except that we kind of think of these as encoding labeling, so we're going to have more sets. We're going to have s sub superscript u1 through s superscript u of l over here. <coughs> okay. And Thank you. 
right, very slantily. For V, which is attached to U, um, S U sub I covers, again, the X's that are in U V prime, but have, well, you might think at first that I'm just going to write S X sub I equals zero here, but that doesn't make sense because I ranges between one and L, but the, there's only these strings on the edges of length R. So I'm actually going to work in the projection here. So I want X sub pi U V I. Okay, so pi U V, you know, this is associated to an edge. Pi U V is a projection from one through L to one through R, so we'll apply it to I and then I'll give us a number in, in one through R. Again, the subsets are this previous shape or are these different subsets? Um, yeah, so if you, that's a good question. So if you just sort of stare at one edge, um, then it's almost exactly like the actual gadget. So you have a ground set that looks like zero, one to the R, and you have sort of one set uh, for each coordinate for covering the ones. That's this guy. You have sort of, these guys are sort of like the S superscript ones of the R coordinates. And then on this side, you actually have sort of, you're also covering the zeros. You sort of have maybe many copies of uh, probably all of the coordinates in here. Um, because you might have multiple I's which project onto the same J. Projection means that these maps by UV are assumed to be onto? Um, you, not necessarily, but we can assume they're onto. You can insist that they're onto in the, the definition of the problem. You should think of them as being onto. Okay. So this is a, yeah, a somewhat complicated definition, but here it is. Uh, okay. So let me put this up a little bit. So I'll just make some remarks here. So for a particular part of the ground set, say omega uv, it's only coverable by the sets s super u i and s super v j. Okay, that's just by construction. Um, so overall, the number of sets is, uh, is R times uh, cardinality of V plus L times the cardinality of V. Uh, oh, let me add a few more things here. So. I didn't quite finish stating the reduction. So this is the reduction, except there's one more thing missing. I told you the ground elements in the sets. I didn't tell you what K is. So the reduction sets this K to be uh, cardinality of U plus cardinality of V. So somehow the idea is that um, it's sort of set up so that Solutions where you take K sets are kind of in correspondence to assignments to the, the bipartite graph, the max projection instance. Uh, and I should also remark, it's polynomial time. I mean, it's supposed to be a polynomial time reduction or an efficient reduction, and it is. You should always remember that L and R are constants. So even though two to the R looks kind of large, it's still a constant. So. Essentially, this thing takes a graph and, you know, puts some things on each vertex and edge. So it's doable efficiently. Okay. So let's put this up. Put this one down. Okay, so I've given the reduction. That's it. So now I need to prove its properties. Uh, the properties that make it a polynomial time reduction from this problem to that problem. And so in particular, you know, I need to prove what's called completeness and soundness. Probably I shouldn't have erased this, but hopefully you remember it. So the completeness
is that this reduction sort of preserves the yes instances. So you need to show that if the optimum, how shall I say this? If there exists an assignment alpha satisfying well a one fraction or all of max projection constraints so if the optimum of the instance of max projection is one then there exists some k sets covering uh, omega in the reduced instance, i.e. the optimum of the reduced instance is also one. Okay. And that will be easy. That's sort of always easy in these proofs because they're sort of designed that way. The soundness is an interesting part and it says that no solutions are preserved. So we need to show here that um, if the best assignment alpha to the max projection instance satisfies at most this, you know, delta cubed over 1,000 fraction of constraints. So the optimum is at most delta cubed over 1,000. Then the optimum in the max k coverage instance is at most uh, three quarters, basically. Then any k sets cover at most uh, three quarters plus delta fraction of omega. So these are exactly the two properties that we need to prove about the reduction to deduce this uh, theorem about there being a polynomial time reduction from approximating max projection, one comma delta to uh, one comma three quarters approximating max k coverage. Is that clear? The outline is clear? Okay, good. So um, this is what we're gonna need to do. It's not too hard. I'll see how much time I have, but it's, it's basically elementary. I mean, you just reason about what we've done. Um, okay. So let's start with the completeness proof because it's very easy. And as I said, it's sort of, the reduction is sort of precisely cooked up to satisfy the completeness. <coughs> Indeed, I hope you're able to guess if you're given this uh, perfect assignment alpha to the max projection instance, how you would get a perfect assignment, a uh, perfect choice of k sets in the coverage instance. Take the natural uh, sets, okay? So uh, given such an alpha, you know, consider the solution where you take a, um, uh, all S superscript uh, W subscript alpha of W for W in U union V. Okay, so you take the assignment corresponding, the sets corresponding to the assignment. Okay, indeed this is K sets. You have one set per vertex and the, in the definition of the reduction, k was equal to the total number of vertices. So this is a valid solution. And we just need to check that it indeed covers everything, okay? So we'll check it covers all of the ground set omega uv. We'll do this for all uv and therefore you cover everything. Uh, well, it's quite clear. So We've chosen S super U of, uh, well, let me do V first. We've chosen S super V of alpha V. And this covers all X in omega UV with X sub alpha V equals one. And we've also covered uh, the other side, so S super U of alpha of U covers, by definition, all X in omega UV with X sub pi UV of alpha U equals zero. That's the definition of 
what the sets mean on the U side. But by assumption, alpha satisfies the UV constraint. Okay, i.e. pi UV of alpha U equals alpha B. Okay. So this index between 1 and R is the same as this index between 1 and R. So we've got you know, a set that covers everything with a 1 in this coordinate, and this set covers everything with a 0 in that same coordinate. Okay, so it's just like the optimal solution in the, the gadget. We cover all the zeros in one coordinate and all the 1s in one co the same coordinate. Okay, I hope that is relatively clear. So that's the easy part. And uh, now we'll do the harder part. Or started at least. Uh, okay, so we now have to need to prove the soundness. <coughs> so we need to show that if the um, optimum of the max projection instance is very small, very close to zero at most some delta cubed over 1,000, then the optimum of the coverage instance is not much bigger than three quarters. That's our task. Now in all these results, the soundness is always proved in the, the contrapositive. Okay? So we're going to do the soundness by contrapositive. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, that means that if the optimum of the coverage instance is bigger than three quarters plus delta, then the optimum of the max projection instance is bigger than delta cubed over 1,000. So suppose there are, there's a collection, script S, of K, V sets with coverage at least three quarters plus delta on omega. Okay. So the optimum is bigger than three quarters. We want to show the optimum on the, the label cover instance, the max projection instance is slightly big. Um, and what we want to do is sort of, as I alluded to last time, somehow decode this solution to an assignment for the max projection problem. Okay, so we'll decode. This doesn't have any really precise meaning. Well, it just means what it means. Uh, S into an assignment alpha. You know, it maps u into the integers between 1 and l and v into the integers between 1 and r, um, satisfying at least uh, delta cubed over 1,000 fraction of the pi uv constraints. An excellent point. Uh, as Nati says, that's a, that's a very good point to bring up. So in fact, um, three quarters is a bit of a magic number for this construction. Consider a set, a collection of sets script S uh, that just took any old set, one per vertex. Just it didn't even care, you know, there's L choices here and R choices here. It didn't care, you just took one per vertex. So indeed you've taken K sets. So what will its coverage be? Well, uh, on a particular omega E, like this set, you've got one set from over here and one set from over here. Uh, covering, well, this guy covers everything that has a one in some coordinate, and this guy covers everything that has a zero in some coordinate. And if they're different coordinates, then you'll have, as we saw earlier, uh, you'll achieve coverage three quarters there. Okay, so in fact, you'll achieve three quarters on every uh, part of the ground set, omega E. 
And so overall, we achieve coverage three quarters. So any trivial solution at all, any old solution will get three quarters, okay? So this is saying if you get even a little bit better than that, you must be doing something somehow smart. You must be somehow picking a, a, a lot of the time pairs of sets that correspond to the same coordinates. And by construction, that's kind of like saying you're picking some fraction that noticeable fraction of the time sets corresponding to indices which are consistent. They satisfy the projection. Okay. That's basically the proof, I mean, to finish it off. Um, I'll say a few more things about it. Uh, okay, so, um, good. So we need to figure out how to do this. Now, one slight difficulty is that this set script S, it does not have to choose exactly one set per vertex. It could do something different. But we still need to figure out how to decode it into a, an assignment. So I'll make some definitions along that will help us out. Um, for a vertex V on the V side, uh, I'm going to define a set of integers, which I'll call suggest, suggest of V, uh, which is just all the J's in 1 through R, such that the set uh, SVJ is chosen. Okay, so kind of in the completeness case or in the ideal world, this is a set of size 1, but could be of size 0 or of size bigger than 1. Okay, similarly on the U side, uh, we'll define suggest of U to be the I's in 1 through L, such that S, U, I is chosen. And one more piece of notation for U, V, an edge, we'll define sets of U, V to be the list of all the S, U, I, and S, V, J in script S. Okay, so this will be a list of sets that we chose, all the ones that sort of are attached to this edge U comma B. Okay, hmm. let's erase the completeness. Okay. So, just some remarks. Of course, just by uh, definition, the cardinality of this list is just the sum of uh, the cardinality of these two suggestion sets. Okay. And see, this set, the sets comma UV is a, a list of sets uh, which cover a particular omega UV, right? So it's actually quite like a situation where we were just analyzing the gadget at the beginning. We have some list of sets, possibly, you know, zero to any number, um, that are covering elements in this way of zero, one to the R. And we have this notion of consistency from before, when you took two sets corresponding to the same coordinate. And in this particular case, this set UV is consistent according to our old definition, now erased. Um, if and only if, well, you choose two sets corresponding to the same coordinate, which in this context means there exists an I in the suggestion set for U. You took something for the U side that uh, has the I coordinate, and there exists a J in the suggestion set for V, um, such that pi U V I equals J. So this, sets, this list of sets is consistent if and only if there's some label in this set and some label in this set which are 
valid labelings for the constraint pi sub u of v. That's a key property. Um, now also, since uh, the cardinality of S is K, which is u plus v, we have um, that sort of suggests the cardinality of the suggestion set for a vertex W on either side is one on average. If you average over all the vertices in U um, union V, and it's a corollary, this is the important one, uh, the average over edges of the cardinality of this list sets UV is 2. Okay, and this uses, this is a very simple calculation using the fact that I insisted on long ago that the cardinality of U equals the cardinality of V and that it's regular. It's sort of taking a random edge is kind of the same as taking, or taking a vertex and a random edge attached to it is the same as taking a random edge. Um, okay, so let me now finish the actual proof. I kind of sketched the, um, the idea behind it. The idea behind it is imagine sort of a model case where by luck all of these sets or all these lists, sets of u comma v had cardinality exactly two. Okay. Then um, you'd be choosing two sets uh, for each edge and if in addition these sets, uh, these two sets were consistent in this case, they would be achieving coverage one on this edge. Um, but if they're not consistent in this definition, then as we saw before, they're achieving coverage three quarters on this edge. So if overall, as per our assumption at the very beginning, that the set, uh, the collection script S is overall achieving coverage three quarters plus delta, it must mean that for basically a delta fraction of the edges, you're getting coverage one. So you're getting, um, that this set is consistent for a delta fraction of the edges. Okay, and then if it's, you know, these sets are of cardinality exactly two, then you would um, take the corresponding assignment that is naturally suggested by them. And you would satisfy a delta fraction of the edges in the max uh, projection instance. Now in general, this doesn't happen to happen. Some of these are maybe of uh, cardinality less than two, and maybe some of them are cardinality much bigger than two. Um, but somehow still, if you do a few extra tricks, if on average their cardinality is two, then there has to be a decent fraction of edges where two things happen. One, this list of sets is consistent. And two, the cardinality of the number of sets chosen is not too large, maybe not too bigger than one over delta. And then if you build an assignment, ultimately you choose an assignment alpha, which maps u into L and v into R by uh, taking alpha of w uh, is a random element of the suggestion set w. Or if it's empty and arbitrary one. And somehow if these suggestion sets are not too big and they're occasionally consistent, then there's some, you know, positive chance that this random assignment will satisfy the edge. And so in expectation, you'll satisfy some constant depending on delta fraction of the edges. Okay, I probably could have, you know, done the whole proof in like 10 extra minutes, but I only have 10 extra minutes and I have a bit more I want to say. So um, you could all finish this proof if you took the time. Okay, despite the sketching, <laughs> are there any questions? So is the cube uh, the third power necessary? I don't know. You could probably get it. You might be able to get it to a square. Um, I don't even know. Maybe you could if you worked hard enough. Um, so you can just argue that you can get a better solution. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, if it is consistent, keep the consistent pair. If it's not, you can throw away all the other and throw uh, and pick one edge where, where it's not big. 
So every edge which was consistent, you would still remain one. Every edge that was inconsistent, you would lose at most one fourth, which you would gain at the end of the edges. Yeah, you have to be. That may well work. You have to be, uh, ultimately the, the conclusion of this proof relies on the fact that one minus two to the minus t is concave. So that, you know, if you're using 10 sets over here and like one set over here, you know, one minus two to the minus 10 and also one minus two to the minus one, it's better, yeah, if you push them both to their average too. So maybe you're right, in which case, if you show it's always best to make these sets of size, these lists of sets of size two, yeah, it might even be linear. Look at the subgraph on which you are consistent mm -hmm. and you try to realize it in the most efficient way and very likely you can just do with one surprise. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. I'm a bit confused. Yeah, sometimes this suggestion of, of uh, V or U is, a, is empty, right? Right. So again, so what do you do in that case? Good. So you make it a random element of this unless it's empty, in which case you choose it arbitrarily. Um, basically, eventually, you'll only argue uh, about the uh, edges UV where this set is, this list of sets is consistent. You don't even worry about what happens on the other UV. And in particular, if it's consistent, then um, it has to be, both sides have to be non empty. Yeah, but this empty case will happen often, maybe half the time. That's true. It may happen even lots of the time. Um, but the, the thing that helps us is that we only have to come up with an assignment alpha that satisfies a very small fraction of the edges, just the delta cubed over 1,000. So we can even throw away all these edges where nothing good is happening. Maybe some of the sets are empty. It's just enough to get a tiny fraction of the edges in the max projection thing satisfied. So we can not worry about lots of bad things happening. And indeed, this is the real power of max projections hardness result, this label cover hardness result of one comma delta for any small delta. You can make this as small as you want. This is, could have even been two to the minus O of one over delta. Lots of, you only have to just to satisfy a very small number of uh, constraints in the max projection instance to make this proof work. Okay, so. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so let me say, I'll say now I'll conclude by saying a few words about sort of summarizing what we use in this proof and how we can use it in future proofs. Okay, so let me end with that. So this proof I just mainly did is sort of how all of the proofs of hardness approximation kind of go. I mean, the details are different in each case, but they sort of depend, uh, the details just enter in terms of the gadget. Okay, so uh, somehow there's this, this methodology, which maybe I'll call the gadget suffice methodology. Which says the following, if you want to prove um, maybe C comma S plus an arbitrarily small delta in approximability for your favorite CSP, so I'll call it max blah, it could be max uh, cut or max three lin or what have you, max gate cover. Uh, what you do is you reduce from max projection as we did here. Oops. Um, using a gadget which is just an instance of max blah. With some special properties. Now, I have to state these, well, some of these properties kind of vaguely, but this is the idea. Uh, the first one is that the sort of the ground set or uh, the vertex set or the variable set, whatever you're sort of calling it. So in this case, the ground set, if you're reducing the max cut, let's say the, the, the vertex set, 
is always identified with 0, 1 to the r. It looks a bit funny, and, but there's actually a good reason for it, which I don't have time to explain, but it's always like this in gadgets. Uh, two, the opts of the gadget should be C, this C that you're trying to prove the hardness for. Okay, just like in this case, the optimum of the gadget was one because we're trying to prove one hardness, one versus S hardness. But furthermore, again, like we saw here, there should actually exist R optimal solutions that sort of correspond, and this is, um, this is a vague statement, to the sets that look like uh, X such that XI equals one. Okay, so somehow the R optimal solutions should correspond to like the coordinate subsets of this ground set. That was quite like in our gadget. Um, property three, every solution to the gadget, optimal or not, should somehow somehow suggest at most a constant number of coordinate solutions or optimal solutions. Okay, this didn't quite come out in the proof exactly here, but if I'd done the full details, we would have seen it a bit better. Um, but somehow you want to map, associate to any solution, a constant number of solutions. This will depend on delta. Okay. And the last uh, property is that a solution which suggests zero optimal or coordinate solutions should have value which is like s, at most s plus little o of one or the little o is with respect to this delta. Okay, so these statements are a bit vague. What exactly does this suggest mean? Uh, and so forth. Um, but I hope that you got the flavor of this through the proof we just saw and how the gadget we constructed for max k coverage, a particular ground instance of, of max k coverage, you know, had these four properties in some sense. This S was three quarters and the C was one in our case. Okay. And the great thing is, as it turns out, this is sort of stated as though it's a theorem, although the words in it are vague enough that it, it's not actually a theorem. But uh, the good news is there is a, you can formulate a theorem, an actual theorem, along these lines. If in particular you define everything properly. So this is a theorem, but uh, this methodology of gadgets sufficing is a theorem. This methodology is a theorem. Aha, however, there's a catch. But uh, only if you reduce not from max projection, but from another problem, which I'll call max bijection. Okay. Well, uh, what's max bijection? You may even be able to guess. It's an algorithms problem. It's the same as max projection, which we saw, except that the pi UVs are bijections. And I guess in particular that implies, remember max projection actually has these two parameters L and R. Uh, max bijection only has one thing, R. So this is like R comma R. Okay, if the pi UVs are gonna be bijections, L and R better be the same. Um, okay, so that's great. Um, 
if you instead reduce from max projection, you reduce from max bijection, then there's a theorem that exactly formulates this, which means that if you want to prove any sort of hardness result that you like, it's enough just to construct a gadget that has these properties, which is kind of fun, right? It's like a combinatorial or a analytic problem to construct a specific instance. And then you just sure you plug it into some nonsense and you get the hardness result that you want. There's only one drawback, though. Uh, I never said that this problem was actually a hard problem, which, of course, we would want it to be. Uh, so here's the false theorem. False theorem says that this max bijection is you know, equally hard as max projection. So the false theorem is that for all delta, um, max bijection, I guess you should say in analogy, there exists an R such that one delta approximating max bijection R is NP hard. Uh, so sadly, that's false, at least if P does not equal NP, because there's a trivial algorithm which does great on max bijection instances where the opt is one. So this is an exercise, it's very easy. One, one approximating max bijection is in P. I mean, there's a very easy algorithm which does this level of approximation. So if I give you a max bijection instance where there's a perfect solution, it's very easy to find that perfect solution. So we simply don't have the same level of hardness that we had for max projection. So it looks like this theorem is maybe useless, but what we do have is a conjecture. This is the uh, unique games conjecture. Uh, don't ask why it's called the unique games conjecture. It's some weird historical reasons. In fact, just call it the UG conjecture so you can forget about what it stands for. And uh, this is due to Coat from O2. And it says the following. Uh, for all delta, there exists an R such that um, max bijection with parameter R, label set of size R, is one minus delta delta in a prox. So almost the same as max projection. Um, it's saying that, you know, if there's a perfect solution for max bijection, it's easy to find it. But if there's only like a 99% perfect solution, one that satisfies 99% of the bijections, uh, Coates' conjecture is that it's hard for algorithms to even satisfy 1%. And if you believe this conjecture, which is highly contentious and uh, it's unclear what fraction people believe it, maybe 50% believe it and 50 don't, I like to think that it's true. Uh, but if you believe it, then you can use this theorem and you get this, although you actually only get C minus delta here. I should add that um, there is a version of this theorem that involves reducing from max projection, which is good because we know NP hardness for that. But in order to use that theorem, you have to construct a more complicated gadget. It needs to be a gadget that's, that has some even more complicated properties involving tolerating some projections. Okay, so sometimes you can do it. It's a bit of a chore, but it's often done. Um, but if you believe the unique games conjecture, all your worries about proving the hardness of approximation are reduced to analyzing these kind of gadgets. So next time, I'll introduce these kind of gadgets for a couple of interesting problems like max cut and max three lin, and we'll actually see some interesting mathematics associated to them. Okay, thanks. Yeah. This last problem is in NP? Um, yes, uh, essentially yes, because if, if somebody gives you a solution, an assignment, you can easily check what fraction of the constraints is satisfying. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yes, yes Pierre? Sorry. So, can I get this right? You said that this max bijection approximability is not up to one, but a little bit low. Mm -hmm. right? Then, well, Assuming that this is empty hard, you can use this gadget technology and infer 
so in the, in the approximability results graph, other uh, constraint satisfaction problems or other. Yes. That is what you was. Yes, that's right. So, and this does not involve any sophisticated mathematics. No, so um, the proof of this theorem that formalizes this is not sophisticated or anything. It's much, it's quite like we did uh, in this case for max k coverage. I mean, you take this gadget and you plug it in, you put a copy of it on every edge in the max bijection instance and you do some elementary reasoning um, to get the results. So you mean something like uh, proving a uh, UGC hardness using the now terminology is now is routine. Uh, um, it's routine in the sense that it's uh, it's reduced in a routine manner to analyzing gadgets. So, but analyzing gadgets is not uh, necessarily constructing gadgets with nice properties and analyzing the properties of them is not routine, and that's where there's a lot of interesting mathematics. So, generally, um, this is the main uh, interesting fact. Sorry. Yeah. So do you mean that what is routine is to obtain some, uh, some ratio of approximation, but then to get some good ratio? Yeah, that's... Ratio, this requires uh, some delicate analysis of all these steps here, especially last step. That's right. And that's precisely what you'll do tomorrow in some example. Exactly. Thank you. David? Max K cover is not a CSP, yeah. So this is not exactly, a, doesn't quite apply to Max K cover. Yes, but adding insisting that you choose exactly k sets is sort of a side constraint. That's yeah. No, so the right number for for max k coverage is actually uh, one minus one over e, and um, you get it by instead of starting with a bipartite version of label cover, you start with like a k partite version of label cover, and your gadgets. Sorry, maybe. An, B partite version, and your gadgets look like one, two, up to the B to the R, and you have like B coordinates for it. And uh, somehow the coverage is like one minus one minus one over B to the B or something. Um, I don't know if I was answering your question, but this is the, the gist of how to get the sharp one minus one over E for max K coverage. Uh, yes, although it's weird because I mean max k coverage where k equals two overall is not hard because you can try all pairs of sets. But yes. More questions? Okay, thanks.